Well, we're on the final stretch for today. One more study together and we'll be finished with number 12. One for each of the 12 apostles. And then we have 12 more left. We still have to study. We're going to do right now the fourth uh, seal. And I believe that we'll be able to finish that. And uh, then uh, tomorrow, we'll dedicate the first two hours probably to the fifth seal. And then we'll dedicate the next two hours in the afternoon to the sixth seal. And then uh, we have to dedicate two or three sessions to the interlude, one to the seventh seal, and then whatever time we have left over, uh, we'll dedicate to the, uh, the last five uh, lessons in the syllabus on the issue of the seal of God and the mark of the beast. But let's have a word of prayer before we have, begin our last session. Our Father and our God, uh, we thank you for being the guide and the arbiter of history. Many times it appears to us that Satan is the one who wins and you lose, but we know that in the end, what you allow and what you cause will eventually lead to total and complete victory. And Lord, we want to continue studying to see how you have led in the past, because we know that the same God who has led in the past will lead us in the future. So give us uh, clear minds and give us willing hearts that your word will not return unto you void. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Page 191. Page 191. We are now going to study about the fourth seal, the pale horse. Some versions say the yellow horse. And, uh, but really a better translation is the pale horse. Now, what is the meaning? Just, let's, let's just uh, see what the meaning of this period is. The fourth seal represents the period of papal dominion during what is known as the Dark Ages. The scarcity of God's word and reign led to spiritual famine, pestilence, and death. In addition, the apostate church literally killed the martyrs who did not agree with the traditions of men. So let's read Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, where you have a description of the fourth seal. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed him. Certainly this isn't Jesus, right? And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and I have in brackets pestilence, because that's probably what it means, with death and by the beasts of the earth. So we have several symbols in this fourth seal. First of all, the color pale. The Greek word is chloros. The color of this horse is really a greenish pale, as when a young shoot comes out of a tree. It is the paleness of death. And then you have death and Hades. When a person dies, the grave follows death, because people are buried after they die. The fourth part of the earth shows that the devastating power of the fourth horse and its rider is not universal, it's only partial. The famine represents the fact that there is a scarcity of God's word. Pestilence, and there's a note on this, in the New Testament, Greek, the word thanatos technically means death. However, in 30 of the 50 times that this word appears in the Greek Old Testament, it is translated pestilence. To say that the fourth horse kills with death would be redundant. <laughs> you can't kill any other way than with death. So probably what it means is famine follows it. And then we have death by the sword, and famine brings pestilence, or disease in its train and ultimately leads to death and to the grave. 
And then we have the wild beasts. I have several texts that explain what this means. They are wicked leaders and nations who were inimical to God's people and behaved like wild beasts. The Bible defends that view as well as the spirit of prophecy. Now, let's notice an Old Testament background, first of all, to the fourth seal, the fourth horse. In Old Testament times, by the way, you're, um, I'll give you this homework. Read Leviticus 26, 21 to 26. That's an important passage. I didn't include it, but it speaks about the four judgments of God upon apostate Israel. In Old Testament times, when Israel broke the covenant, apostatized from truth, and assimilated pagan customs, which is what happened in the third horse, God would send the very same four judgments that are mentioned in connection with the fourth horse. And those judgments were the sword, famine, pestilence, which follows famine, by the way, and ultimately wild beasts. You can find all four of these judgments in Leviticus 26. That's the foundation. Did the church during the third period break God's covenant? It most certainly did. Now, because Israel, this is an important principle, because Israel in the Old Testament period were God's literal people living in the literal land of Canaan, these judgments were what? Literal. However, under the fourth seal, as well as in the other seals, we are dealing with which Israel? Spiritual Israel in a spiritual land, which is the Christian church, and therefore we need to interpret these calamities in a symbolic manner. And then we have in parentheses the text that you need to look at. This is very important in Daniel 11, 28, 30, and 32. This is a period of papal dominion. It's a period of the fourth horse. And there we are explicitly told that the papacy trampled on God's holy covenant during the 1260 years. So would we expect the same four judgments if the papacy trampled on the covenant? Absolutely. Now let's talk about death and Hades. The immediate aftermath of death is the place where the dead go. <laughs> and where is that? The grave. The word Hades in the Greek is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Sheol. And it should consistently be translated the grave. We find the link between the Hebrew and the Greek words in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, and 55. We'll, cut, we'll read these a little bit later where the Apostle Paul quotes Hosea 13, verse 14, and uses the word Hades in place of Sheol. So in the book of Hosea, the word for grave is Sheol. The Apostle Paul uses the word Hades. That shows that Sheol and Hades are synonymous words in different languages. Unfortunately, the King James Version 31 times mistakenly translates the Hebrew word Sheol with the word hell. It really should be translated the grave. The Old Testament regularly links the concepts of death and the grave in synonymous parallelism. In other words, death and the grave are somewhat synonymous because when a person dies, they, they, they go to the grave. Notice Psalm 6 verse 5. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave who will give you thanks? Does the second line explain and amplify the first line? Is it the same thought in different words? Yeah, it's the same to say, for in death there is no remembrance of you, in the grave who will give you praise. So death and the grave are linked together, because when a person dies they go to the grave. Notice Psalm 89 verse 48, and there are many more. In the State of the Dead series I have an entire presentation on death and Hades, particularly on Hades, as it appears all throughout Scripture in the Old and the New Testament. Psalm 89 48, what, can a man, what man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? grave. Notice once again, death and the grave together. Psalm 116 verse 3, here the psalmist says, The pains of death surrounded me, and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. So once again, death and Sheol are used synonymously. Notice Isaiah 38 verse 18, For Sheol cannot thank you, 
death cannot praise you. See, once again, death and the grave together. For Sheol cannot thank you, death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope in your truth. Isaiah 28, 15. I've only given you a sampling here so that you see that I'm not just choosing one little verse and making an entire application out of that. The fact is that death and the grave are linked together not only in Revelation chapter 6. So it says in Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 15, Because you have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we are in agreement. Is a covenant an agreement? So our death and the grave linked together, are they synonymous, basically? Yes. Now here comes the key text, Hosea 13, verse 14. Hosea 13 and verse 14. I will, God is speaking here, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from what? From death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. The Apostle Paul paraphrases this in 1 Corinthians 15. So let's go there just for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let's notice how the Apostle Paul is actually drawing on Hosea. He doesn't quote it textually, but he's drawing on the terminology. Only instead of the word, uh, the word grave, which is Hades, he uses the word Sheol, which is the Hebrew Old Testament word. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 54. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? So is Paul drawing on uh, the book of Hosea? Yes, he's drawing on Hosea. Only in Hosea, the word for grave is Sheol. The word for grave in the New Testament Greek is Hades. And so death and Hades are linked together, just like death and Sheol are linked together. So the question is, um, does the word Sheol and does the word Hades mean hell, a place of burning? No. It simply means the grave. When a person dies, the next step is what? To be buried in the grave. Death and the grave followed this yellow horse. Now another place where we can link the word Sheol with the word Hades is in Acts 2, 25-27 and verses 30 and 31. Here Peter on the day of Pentecost is drawing on a passage that we find in Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10. And in the Greek, the word grave is the word Hades. Whereas in the Old Testament, in Psalm 16, the word is Sheol. That's why we know that Sheol and Hades are synonymous in different languages. Notice uh, Acts 2, 25 to 27 and verse 30 and 31. For David says concerning him, and he's getting this from Psalm 16, 8 through 10, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad, moreover my flesh also will rest in hope. This is Jesus speaking prophetically. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, the New King James transliterates the word from the Greek, Hades. Other versions, like the New International Version, like I was saying, the, the New International Version doesn't uh, translate, for you not, will not leave my soul in Hades or in hell, like the King James Version says. The New International Version says, you will not leave me in the grave. It's a much better translation. You will not leave my soul, or you will not leave me in Hades or the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So the word here for grave is, or Hades, or grave, is Hades. In the Old Testament, where this is coming from, the word is Sheol. So Sheol and Hades are the same word in different languages. Verse 30, 
Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he foreseeing this, that is David, seen, foreseeing this, spoke concerning what? The resurrection of the Christ, that his soul, that is he, was not left in Hades or the grave, nor did his flesh see corruption. So basically, when, uh, when this horse, you have a reference to death and Hades, it doesn't mean death and hell. It means death and what? Death and the grave, because this is the pale horse. This is the horse that brings death. First by famine, because there's famine for the word of God, and there's darkness that we notice under the third horse. And secondly, because those who don't agree with the church are being killed, physically killed. That's why the martyrs are crying out in the fifth seal. So far, so good? Now, now the key question at this point is this. What caused this church to die and to go to the grave? The answer is that four factors led to death and to the grave. First of all, the sword. The key verses, and we've covered this before so we don't have to dwell a lot on it, the key verses to understand the symbolic meaning of the sword in the fourth seal are Romans 13, 1 to 4, and Revelation 13, verse 10 and verse 14. As we have seen, more often than not, when the sword of the Spirit convicts of sin, what happens? It awakens the sword of persecution on the part of those who wish to suppress it. And uh, we notice that in the third seal, right? Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 37. I'm not going to read Romans 13 again. Romans 13, verses 1 through 4. Let's just read verse 4 in that passage. Speaking about the civil power, it says, For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do, do evil, be afraid. For he, that is the civil ruler, does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and a, an avenger to execute wrath on him who what? On him who practices evil. Now let's read the note and then I'm going to give you an additional explanation. In apocalyptic prophecy, symbols are fluid. They take different shapes depending on where they appear. That is, that the sword can represent the Word of God, right? But when the Word of God is proclaimed, what happens? The church then appeals to the sword of civil power to punish those who don't agree with the church. Let me ask you this. Did the papacy use the sword during this period to kill? What sword? It used the Bible to kill, right? Hmm. Can't represent the Bible. The papacy did not use the Bible to kill. What did it use? It used the sword of the civil power. How many armies does the papacy have? How many tanks? How many missiles? It will have all of them because it links up with the states and it has all of the support of the states. But it has none of its own, right? What did the papacy do during the 1260 years? It linked up with the state and it used the sword of the state to punish those who did not agree with its practices and its beliefs. It killed with what? With the sword. But the interesting thing is that this same power that killed with the sword received a deadly wound by the sword. Notice Revelation 13, 9 and 10. This is at the top of page 196. Revelation 13, verses 9 and 10. It says, Anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. Did the papacy lead into captivity? Yes. Was the papacy led into captivity? He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So the papacy killed with the sword, and the sword gave the papacy its deadly wound. The papacy led into captivity, and the papacy was taken into captivity. So the first thing that, the, that, that the, um, this yellow horse does 
is take away peace by killing those who do not agree with the church with the sword, with the aid or the help of the state. Now let's notice the note under this uh, text, Revelation 13, 9 and 10. The New King James Version of Revelation 6 verse 8 tells us that power was given, listen to the, to the tense of the verb, power was given, and a better translation is not power, authority. There are two Greek words that are translated power in the King James and the New King James. The word, uh, the first is the word dunamis, where we get the word dynamite from, that's not the word here. The word is exousia, which means authority. So it says here that uh, this power was given authority to death and the grave to kill with the sword. It is hardly a coincidence that the little horn, if you read Daniel 7.25, it says, was given power to make war against the saints and overcome them. In Revelation 13 verse 7, the beast, which is equivalent to the little horn in Daniel 7, once again it tells us the beast was given power to make war with the saints. Are you catching the picture? Now, how else did the papal system kill people? In symbolic terms, famine comes when the Holy Spirit, speaking through the Word, is scarce. Famine comes when it doesn't rain. And when it doesn't rain, there's a scarcity of food, right? Now, during the Dark Ages, there was no what? No rain. We're not talking about literal rain. You say, how do we know that during the 1260 years there was no rain? Because in Revelation 11 it says that the two witnesses closed the heavens so that it would not rain during their prophecy. The same period. So there was no rain. And therefore, what happened? Bread was scarce. The result was what? Famine, spiritual hunger. Famine in turn led to what? Malnutrition. And mad malnutrition led to pestilence, disease. And ultimately pestilence led to what? To death. Are you catching the picture? The prophet Isaiah explained the symbolic meaning of rain, bread, and the word. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So does rain, does the falling of rain have anything to do with giving bread? Yes or no? Yes. Now comes the comparison to rain and bread. Rain makes the crop grow, and then the grain is harvested, and bread is made. When there's no rain, the result is that you, that you don't have, you know, it's very expensive, like we noticed in the third seal. Here comes the comparison, verse 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Was there a scarcity of the Holy Spirit during the period of the, of the Roman Catholic papacy? Was there a scarcity of the Word of God? Listen, the Waldenses had to hide in the Piedmont. And they wrote texts of scripture on little pieces of parchment. And they were, they were traveling salesmen. And they, would, they would give these, these uh, pieces of parchment with scriptures to people. Because reading the scriptures to the lay people was strictly forbidden. So was there famine during this period? Yes, because the spirit was scarce. Was there spiritual hunger? Yes, and whoever did not agree with the church, what did the church do? It used the state, the sword of the state, to kill those who did not agree with the church. Notice Deuteronomy 32 verse 2. Let my teaching drop as rain. So teaching, once again, is, is uh, related to rain. My speech distill as the dew, as raindrops on the tender herb, and as showers on the grass. Notice Hosea, once again, knowledge of the Lord, a speech, God's word, 
all have to do with God communicating to us. It said, let us know, let us pursue what? The knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like what? Like the rain, like the latter and the former rain. A time is coming when there's going to be famine in the earth. Was there famine during the 1260 years? Yes. yes. But Amos chapter 8 verses 11 and 12 is talking about a famine. You know, even during the dark ages when the papacy had dominion, there was still some of God's word and there were still some of God's faithful people that assimilated the word. But the time is coming when probation closes, when nobody is going to be able to find the word of God because there's going to be a famine in the land and they will seek for the word of God. They will not be able to find it. Notice what it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, once again, bread is related with water, with the Holy Spirit, but of hearing what? The words of the Lord. See, when it rains, the crop grows. The Holy Spirit falls, is connected with the Word. And as a result, people are spiritually healthy. Verse 12, they shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord. In other words, they're looking for bread, but there's famine, but shall not find it. Are you catching the picture? Now what about the wild beasts? The wild beasts are also symbolic. We're dealing with symbols, right? Now, in Scripture, wild individuals who are hateful and want to destroy God's people are compared to wild beasts. Let's read several texts. Psalm 74, 18 and 19. Remember this, that the enemy has reproached, O Lord, and that a foolish people has blasphemed your name. Oh, do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. <coughs> so who is compared with the wild beast? The enemy. Notice Psalm 7, verses 1 and 2. Lord my God, in you I put my trust. Save me from all those who persecute me and deliver me. Lest they, who is they? Those that persecute, right? Lest they... Tear me like a lion, rending me in pieces, while there is none to deliver. Once again, enemies are compared to a lion that devours and tears in pieces. Psalm 10, verses 9 and 11. What principle are we using here to understand what the wild beasts represent? Symbolic. What, what are we doing? Does, uh, does the fourth seal explain what the wild beasts are? Does it tell you what the wild beasts symbolize? No, it doesn't tell you. So what do we do? Well, we see what wild beasts mean symbolically in other places in Scripture. It's that simple. Now notice Psalm 10, verses 9, 11, 9 through 11. He lies in wait secretly, this is the enemy, as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches. <laughs> notice again, using all of the mannerisms of the lion. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. Is that what the religious leaders said during the 1260 years? Was God seen? He was writing it all in the heavenly books because he's going to rectify all of those wrong judgments. You know, it makes me think of, uh, of John Huss. Ever heard of John Huss? You know, he was tried there in the cathedral in, uh, in Prague, in Constance, actually. He was taken to, to Constance from Prague. He was tried in the cathedral, and he was found guilty. Was he guilty? No. no. And he was taken, and he was burned at the stake. Was that just? No. no, totally unjust. The earthly judgment was wrong. Does the time have to come when that needs to be rectified? Where is it rectified? when Hassa's name appears in the heavenly judgment. It will be shown that those who did that to him were wrong and Hassa was right. 
and the reward will be given to us. In other words, the reward will be reversed. Hus will be rewarded with eternal life, like should have happened before, and those who oppressed him will suffer eternal death. The purpose of the judgment, to rectify there in Daniel chapter 7. Notice Psalm, 7, uh, Psalm 17, verses 9 through 12. From the wicked who oppress me, from my deadly enemies who surround me, they have closed up their fat hearts. With their mouths they speak loudly. They have now surrounded us in our steps. They have set their eyes crouching down to the earth as a lion is eager to tear his prey and like a young lion lurking in secret places. Psalm 22, 12 and 13. This is a messianic psalm. It's talking about the sufferings of Christ at the hand of His enemies. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. Proverbs 28, verse 15. Like a roaring lion and a charging bear is a wicked ruler over poor people. Zechariah 10, verse 3, My anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the goat herds. Literally, in the Hebrew, the, the goat herds are the leaders, such as in, in the NIV. For the Lord of hosts will visit His flock, the house of Judah, and will make them as His royal horse in battle. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament warned the church at Ephesus, with the following words, For I know this, that after my departure, what? Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Is that speaking about uh, real literal wolves, or is it symbolic wolves? Symbolic. symbolic wolves. Notice Matthew 7, verse 15. Here Jesus speaks, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Are you catching the picture of what wild beasts mean? Now Ellen White adds her testimony. Review and Herald, August 18, 1896. The symbols of earthly governments are what? Wild beasts. But in the kingdom of Christ men are called upon to behold not a ferocious beast, but the Lamb of God. Ellen White is speaking here about the hatred that Doeg the Edomite had against Saul, King Saul. It says... Uh, actually, uh, actually, Doeg uh, led to the, to the destruction of an entire city with all of the priests, 85 priests, all of the people there, all of the beasts. The city was totally demolished because Doeg hated David. But we'll, I won't get into that story right now. He didn't hate Saul, he hated David. Like savage beasts who have tasted of blood, so were who? Saul and Doeg, they allied themselves to try and get rid of David. So notice, Saul and Doeg are compared to what? To savage beasts. Uh, notice the following, uh, following statement. Uh, this is uh, the condemnation of Christ. When the condemnation of Jesus was pronounced by the judges, a satanic fury took possession of the people. The roar of voices was like that of what? Wild beasts. They made a rush toward Jesus, crying, He is guilty, put Him to death. And had it not been for the Roman soldiers, Jesus would not have lived to be hanged upon the cross of Calvary. He would have been what? Torn in pieces. What is it that tears things in pieces? Wild beasts. He would have been torn in pieces before His judges had not Roman authority interfered by force of arms, withheld the violence of the mob. Here's sketches from the life of Paul, page 19. At this, the priests and rulers were beside themselves with anger. This is the stoning of Stephen. They were more like wild beasts of prey than like human beings. They rushed upon Stephen, gnashing their teeth, just like a wild animal. Notice what we find about the Waldenses. Now we're entering the papal period, because the fourth horse is the period of papal dominion. Once again, wild, the papacy is compared to wild beasts. It says, from some hiding place among the tombs, two madmen rush upon them, as if to tear them in pieces. Actually, this, uh, you know, I put the Waldenses there in the brackets, but really this is speaking about the two 
demon-possessed man. So anyway, let's go back to this. From, the, some, from hiding place among the tombs, two madmen rush upon them. You need to uh, cross out there the Waldensians. These are the two demon-possessed men of Gadara. As if to do what? To tear them in pieces. Hanging about these men are part of chains that they have broken in escaping their confinement. Their flesh is torn and bleeding. Their eyes glare out from their long matted hair. The very likeness of humanity seems to have been blotted out. They look more like what? Like wild beasts than like men. Notice what Ellen White has to say about the papacy. As the ravenous beast is rendered more furious by the taste of blood, so the rage of the papists was kindled to greater intensity by the sufferings of their victims. On the death of Jerome, who uh, was martyred around the same time as John Huss, their thirst for blood, wetted by the death of Huss, clamored for fresh victims. Only by an unreserved surrender of the truth could Jerome preserve his life, but he had determined to avow his faith and follow his brother martyr to the flames. Have you ever read where the Apostle Paul stated that he, that he fought against the wild beasts in the amphitheater? That doesn't mean that Paul was thrown into the Colosseum to fight with lions. Notice this perceptive remark by Ellen White. This is found in uh, Sketches from the Life of Paul, page 78. Paul informed the Corinthians of his trouble in Asia, where he says, We were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. In his first epistle, he speaks of fighting with beasts at Ephesus. He thus refers to the fanatical mob that clamored for his life, they were indeed more like furious wild beasts than men. So how did the papacy uh, uh, treat God's people and try to get rid of God's people? They were like wild beasts. The wild beasts represent the leaders of the papal church that persecuted and tried to kill God's people. The papacy killed people with famine, killed people with the sword, acted like wild beasts. Is this all true of that period of history? of the period of the 1260 years? No doubt whatsoever, absolutely. Now, the period of the fourth horse is the same period as the fourth church. The fourth horse is the period of the papacy. Is that clear in your mind? The fourth horse represents the period of the papacy, where death is being brought about by wild beasts, by, you know, leaders of the church that are just furious, and want to destroy God's people by the sword, using the power of the state, by famine because there's no rain, the Holy Spirit is scarce, the Word of God is scarce, people are dying spiritually, and many are being killed physically as well. This is parallel to the church of Thyatira, the fourth church. Let's draw the parallel. This is where it gets, uh, it gets very, very interesting. The period of the fourth horse is parallel to the period of the fourth church. Thyatira. The Old Testament background to the church of Thyatira is the story of Elijah. Jezebel was the central protagonist during this period. And by the way, the fourth church mentions Jezebel by name. So the church during this period is like Jezebel. So do we need to know something about Jezebel to understand what happened during this period of the church? See, it's going to help us understand even better, uh, notice, noticing what happened during the church, parallel to what happened during the fourth seal, during the yellow horse. So let's go to the notes here. Because Israel apostatized from the covenant of the Lord, the four judgments of Leviticus 26 befell the people. This is in the days of Elijah. In the Old Testament story, Jezebel employed the civil power of, Abel's, of Ahab's sword, is that correct? To extend her apostate, syncretistic religion that blended the worship of the sun god Baal with the worship of the Lord. Was Israel only worshiping Baal or were they claiming to worship both? Elijah said, how long halt ye between two opinions? The Lord is God, follow Him, and if Baal, follow Him. In other words, don't think that you can serve God and also serve Baal at the same time. 
We're told in the story, and we can't read all these verses, you can look them up, Ahab killed the prophets of the Lord, how? With a sword. Is that one of the judgments of the fourth horse? Yes. This apostasy led to a severe what? We're dealing with literal now. Led to a severe drought, because there was no what? Because there was no rain. Does this sound familiar? There was no rain for three and a half years. This is, we're talking now about literal Israel, but it's symbolic of the 1260 years. The drought led to what? Famine and pestilence. Read it in 1 Kings chapter 18, 1 through 6. The four judgments, because Israel forsook the covenant. And the famine and the pestilence in turn led to what? To death and to the grave. Fourth church, fourth horse. Parallel. For a, spa, for a time span of three and a half years, Jezebel slaughtered whom? The prophets of the Lord. Is that what the papacy did? Yes. For not embracing her apostate syncretistic religion. She taught God's servants to what? You can read this in the, in the story of the fourth church. Taught them to what? To fornicate and to practice idolatry. Therefore the blood of God's servants and prophets cried out for what? For justice. Prophetically this story of Jezebel was fulfilled during the period of the dominion of the little horn and of the beast, who massacred the saints of the Most High for three and a half prophetic years. During this period the apostate church employed the sword of the state to kill dissenters. As a result, the church fled to the wilderness, where God nourished her in exile. Is that this happened during the 1260 years? Was he, did Elijah flee to the wilderness and God fed him there? Yes? Uh, how about the church during the 1260 years? Did she flee to the wilderness and God fed her there? See, this typology. As a result, the church fled to the wilderness where God nourished her in exile. This was the period when the two witnesses prophesied in sackcloth, which would represent darkness, right? For 1260 prophetic years, God shut up the heavens and there was no rain. As a result, there was spiritual famine and pestilence in the church. The famine and pestilence ultimately led to what? To death and to the grave. Same thing that happened literally in the days of Elijah happened during the 1260 years. This horse brought death and the grave for two reasons. First, because there was spiritual uh, starvation and pestilence in the church. And second, because people what? People died by the sword. During this period, the man of sin suppressed the Bible, forbidding lay people to read it under pain of death. It was a capital crime even to have a Bible in one's possession. As a result, there was famine for the Word of God. This famine led to spiritual pestilence, and pestilence led to death and to the grave. Are you catching the picture? This was fulfilled exactly during the fourth period of the history of the Christian church. Notice how Ellen White describes this period. For hundreds of years, the circulation of the Bible was what? Was prohibited. So is there going to be famine if the reading of the Bible is prohibited? Yes. The people were forbidden to read it or to have it in their houses. And unprincipled priests and prelates interpreted its teachings to sustain their pretensions. Speaking about the Waldensians, from earliest childhood the youth were instructed in the scriptures and taught to regard sacredly the claims of the law of God. Copies of the Bible were what? Rare. So was the bread scarce? Yes. Many, uh, therefore, its precious words were committed to memory. Many were able to repeat large portions of both the Old and the New Testament. Notice that there was not an absence of bread. Bread was expensive because it was rare. Notice the statement from Spirit of Prophecy, volume 4, page 192. The work which the papacy had begun that is during the 1260 years, atheism completed. This is the French Revolution. The one, that is the papacy, withheld from the people the truths of the Bible. The other, the French Revolution, 
taught them to reject both the Bible and its author. The seed sown by priests and prelates was yielding its evil fruit. During this time, the vile office of the Inquisition was established, which basically was the church using the power of the state to punish dissenters from the church. They slew those who studied and obeyed the word of God. During this time, the papal leaders behaved as wild beasts towards God's people. Notice how Ellen White describes the violence during this period. In the 6th century, the papacy had become firmly established. Its seat of power was fixed in the imperial city, and the bishop of Rome was declared to be the head over the entire church. Paganism had given place to the papacy. The dragon had given to the beast his power and his seat and great authority. And now began the 1260 years of papal oppression, foretold in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Christians were forced to choose either to yield their integrity and accept the papal ceremonies and worship, or wear away their lives in dungeons, or suffer death by the rack, the faggot, or the headsman's axe. Persecution opened upon the faithful with greater fury than ever before, and the world became a vast battlefield. That's what the church was like during the Middle Ages. It's estimated that 50 million of God's faithful children were martyred during this period. Ellen White describes the Inquisition. In the 13th century was established that most terrible of all engines of the papacy, the Inquisition. The Prince of Darkness wrought with the leaders of the papal hierarchy. In their secret councils, Satan and his angels controlled the minds of evil men. While unseen in the midst stood an angel of God, taking the fearful record of their iniquitous decrees and writing the history of deeds too horrible to appear to human eyes. Is everything written in the scroll? Without missing any details? It's all there. Are they going to have to face it again? Are all these individuals who oppress God's people going to resurrect after the, uh, after the millennium? Are they going to see the great panoramic view, panoramic view? Are they going to see what they did? Only now they're going to recognize that, what, that they were on the wrong side, whereas the martyrs were on the right side. She continues, Babylon the Great was drunken with the blood of the saints. And now notice she's going to allude to the fifth seal. She's going to apply the fifth seal to, this period, uh, to, to the aftermath of this period. She says, the mangled forms of millions of martyrs, what? Cried to God for vengeance upon that apostate power. What are the martyrs doing under the fifth seal? They're crying out for justice. So the martyrs are crying out after the papacy has slain God's faithful people, for the better part of 1260 years. Is that the end of the story? Are there going to, is there going to be another group of martyrs? Yes. Is it going to be the same system that will persecute them? So how many stages does the fifth seal have? Two. And I see some with kind of glassy eyes. The fifth seal has two stages, just like the sixth seal. Because the, the martyrs that were killed during the period of papal dominion, they're crying out for justice. They're given a white robe, God is saying, you're fine, your case is okay, you're saved. And they're told, you're going to rest for a while until the rest of the martyrs who are going to be killed like you were is complete. What will be the persecuting power that will persecute God's people in the future? The United States performing the will of the Roman Catholic papacy using the civil powers of the world. See, we haven't believed cunningly devised fables as Adventists. This is all when we study contextually the sequence, the Seventh-day Adventist belief system is rock solid. Trouble is, people only pick a symbol here and pick a symbol there. They don't see all of the structure and the sequence, how, how everything takes place in chronological order, how one event connects with all other events. So during, uh, right after this period, the martyrs have been slain, and now they're crying out to God for justice. 
Here's another statement, Great Controversy, page 78. The persecutions visiting, visited for many centuries upon this God-fearing people, the Waldensians, were endured by them with a patience and constancy that honored their Redeemer, notwithstanding the crusades against them, and the inhuman butchery, there you have the sword, to which they were subjected, they continued to send out their missionaries to scatter the precious truth. They were hunted to death. What is it that hunts? Animals hunt. Human beings do too. Human beings hunt animals, but that's not what this is talking about. <laughs> they were hunted to death, yet their blood watered the seed sown, and it failed not of yielding fruit. Now we're on the last page. We're on a roll here. Uh, so far, so good? Are you understanding the sequence of the seals? How one event leads to another event? So what is the relationship between the third, fourth, and fifth seals? The darkness and scarcity of bread during the third seal intensifies under what? Intensifies under the fourth. And led to death and the grave. Spiritual death, because there's famine for the word, and literal death, because the Inquisition killed all those who were not in harmony with the church. Concerning this period, Ellen White explained, the accession of the Roman church to power marked the beginning of the Dark Ages. As her power increased, what color was the third horse? Black, which is darkness, right? Was there darkness under the third horse? Oh yeah, but the darkness under the fourth intensified. It got worse. So it says, the accession of the Roman church to power marked the beginning of the Dark Ages. As her power increased, the darkness deepened. So is the period of the fourth horse even a greater apostasy than under the third horse? It begins in the third horse, but it deepens under the fourth horse, the period of papal dominion. When the church dies spiritually, because she does not feed on the word of God, she begins to destroy those who do not share her lack of spirituality. Those who cannot defend their doctrines with the spiritual sword will do so with the literal sword. Does that do any good? No, because the more they persecute, the more of the faithful followers God has. Because once again, I repeat, folks, that the reason why the church grows in very difficult times where there's persecution is because people see the constancy and the serenity and the peace of those who are being killed. You say, how can these people, you know, they're being killed and they're singing? Like Hus, Hus, he was, he, his, his flesh was burning and he was singing praises to God. Say, how can a person do this? There must be something worth living for if these people are willing to die for it. So let's check it out. And so that's why the word martyr means witness. The death of the martyrs was a witness, a witness to God. In other words, uh, let me ask you, how many people do you think are going to be saved by the story of the martyrdom of Stephen or the martyrdom of John the Baptist? You know, John the Baptist, he ended up in prison and for a while he was kind of discouraged. You know, he said, Jesus didn't even come to visit me. <laughs> he was depressed. Ellen White says he was depressed. But then the, the disciples that... Uh, that John the Baptist uh, told his disciples, go and ask Jesus if, is he, if he's the Messiah that we're to be, expect. So they went, and Jesus didn't answer. He said, just watch what I'm going to do today. And he healed the sick, he opened the, the eyes of the blind, he healed the lepers, raised the dead, it says there. And then at the end of the day, Jesus says, go tell John what you saw. And so they go back, and they say, he raises the dead, he performs these miracles, he's got to be the Messiah. And Ellen White says that John the Baptist died in peace there in prison. He was beheaded in prison. 
How many people are going to be saved in the kingdom as a result of the story of John the Baptist and Stephen and John Huss? Multitudes of people are going to be saved because of their witness, their willingness to stand for the Lord though the heavens fall, no matter what persecution comes. Notice the last part here. The martyrs whom the papacy slew during the period of the fourth horse will now, not right now, but after this takes place, they will cry out to God to judge and avenge their deaths. This is the period of the fifth seal, which is the topic that we shall study in the next exciting episode. Now, when will God answer, I'll get ahead of myself a little bit here, when will God answer the pleas of the martyrs? When will God judge and avenge God's people who have been slain because of their faith? Revelation 19, the last verses that we're going to read, Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. This is in the context of the seventh plague, and uh, God is going to intervene. By the way, is the harlot in the end time the same harlot that persecuted God's people during the 1260 years? Is it the same harlot? Yeah, it's the papacy. Notice Revelation 19, verses 1 and 2. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. And now notice verse 2. For true and righteous are His judgments. So is God going to rectify everything? True and righteous are His judgments. Because at this point, seventh plague has taken place, because He, what? Has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has what? Avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Are both groups of martyrs going to be avenged by the Lord and justice executed? Absolutely. But meanwhile, the martyrs have to rest for a while. I love the way the Bible expresses that. Rest for a while. Death is like sleeping. How many of you are afraid of going to sleep? I love to go to sleep. <laughs> we don't need to fear death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. So the time is coming where we're going to have to stand for our faith. May the Lord keep us faithful.